discuss the math plus protocol today there is an update on 17th june in that protocol and i wanted to make sure that we are aware of it the basic gist of the change in the protocol or update in the protocol primary update that i saw was that they have removed hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine uh, citing some negative uh, commentary or some with some negative comments so let us look at the study itself the studies th themselves and the protocol update itself so let's look at it i'm going to share my screen so here we are so this is the <clears throat> the protocol june 17th 2020 and here if i can remove this caption so if you see here first of all the math plus stands for methyl prednisolin, ascorbic acid, thiamine, heparin, plus zinc, vitamin D, famotidine, magnesium, and melatonin. So these are the, the medicines that make up the math plus protocol. Let's see what are the updates that are interesting. This is sort of similar as before. However, this is also a very important note that they put, this is a steroid response disease. However, timing is critical, or sorry, steroid responsive disease. So they're saying that this disease can respond to steroid, and I believe in that as well. We'll go over the prophylaxis and those once more, but what I want to see here is the... their commentary about hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. So give me a second to reach there. <clears throat> So here, so if you look at this, notwithstanding the very important and, and impressive results of the recovery dexamethasone study, these are a couple of things that I want us to kind of look at. Methylprednisolin is the corticosteroid of choice for the pulmonary phase of COVID-19. So the first thing that they're saying is that they, they realize that dexamethasone trial has shown good results. They still believe so the authors of this study, they still believe that methylprednisolone is a better choice. And the reason for that is that this is based on pharmacokinetic data, better lung penetration, genomic data specific for SARS-CoV-2, and a long track record of successful use in inflammatory lung diseases. So they still continue to um, make sure that uh, methylprednisolone is more supported. The other thing that is interesting is where is the hydroxychloroquine discussion? Okay, so I have to find it. Give me one second. <clears throat> here. So they're saying not recommended. So if you see here in red, not recommended chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. The use of these agents is extremely controversial notwithstanding the re retraction of the Lancet paper, there is paucity of data to support the use of these drugs. It is possible that the efficacy of these drugs require the co-administration of zinc. So I wanted to make sure that we go over the, the studies that they have cited. So they are talking about the studies from 31 to 35 and 36 and 37. So if I go down to the list of their studies, I actually spent a lot of time today going over these studies to make sure that we have correct knowledge of what they're talking about. So here are the studies. 31st, hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine for the treatment of prophylaxis of COVID-19. I remember talking about this study. Here is that study. And so before going there, this is drbean.com. And our videos for COVID-19 are here plus more. And we have CMEs and CEs available here as well. So if you like, you can actually come and become a member here. I am working with my tech team to make sure that the COVID-19 related uh, videos will stay free. They are not at this time, but we will make the technical changes to make them free. You probably just will have to give your email address and then you'll have access for free to COVID videos. So that is Dr. Bean. And then here, look at this study. First, I wanna show you this, this study. I think you might remember 
that we had discussed this study before. This was an April 24 study. And this study was chloroquine diphosphate. And if you see, I, I remember it was in Brazil and we talked about it in, in Dr. Bean discussions that we are doing here. And look at, look at what they did there. So this is a parallel double masked randomized phase 2B clinical trial with 81 adult patients. So the study itself was nicely structured. But look at what they had done. What they did was, I actually, um, let me show you one second. They had used here, chloroquine. So I cannot go over this. Results in when patients were low dose. So here, patients were allocated to receive high dosage chloroquine, 600 milligram chloroquine twice daily for 10 days. So look at this. Chloroquine is five times more potent than hydroxychloroquine. Chloroquine is more harmful compared to hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine is more in use because it is less harmful and it can be used over a longer period of time if given in therapeutic doses. That doesn't mean that chloroquine is safe. It can actually cause arrhythmias. It can cause retinal issues. It can cause blood, blood disorder aggravation, for, for example, in G6PD. So it should not be hydroxychloroquine, should not be taken without a doctor's prescription. But still, chloroquine is five times more potent. And look at the dose here. They are giving 600 milligram twice. That means 1,200 milligram of chloroquine in one day. Multiply it with five. And that is like 6,000 milligram of hydroxychloroquine. Or I'm, I'm just making it a linear extrapolation, but that is a very large dose. And then they say, or low dose chloroquine, that is 450 milligram twice daily. Again, that is 900 milligram of chloroquine, which is much more potent than hydroxychloroquine. And of course, the results were not good enough. Of course, they started causing people to have arrhythmias and they stopped this trial in the middle. So this is one of the studies that they cite. That is this one here. Effect of high versus low dose of chloroquine diphosphate as adjunctive therapy. So this is this study that I just showed you. And we had talked about it before as well. And I was kind of upset about the study that they used chloroquine instead of hydroxychloroquine. They didn't use zinc. They didn't use other supplements that could be used with it. They didn't use azithromax. On top of that, there was a very large dose. The second study here. The hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine for the treatment of prophylaxis, if you go here, this page, this is actually, look at the study. This study is basically a meta study. This is a collection of data from the other studies and then making an inference from there. So this is once again, not a study which is uh, prospective study, double blind study with multiple arms and so on. This is just a data analysis. And what they have done here is several studies found that patient receiving hydroxychloroquine developed a QTC interval of 500 millisecond or greater, but the proportion of patients with this finding varied among the studies. Then they say two studies assess the efficacy of chloroquine. So here, what they're talking about is this study. One trial which compared high dose 600 milligram twice daily for 10 days with lower dose 450 milligram twice. That's what we just saw. Therapy was stopped owing to the concern that the higher dose therapy increased. Of course, you get, one, you're giving chloroquine. Secondly, you're giving it in a very high dose. It is going to cause an issue. Then they're saying an observational study. So once again, this is an observational study. That means it's kind of a retrospective, something that had already happened. And then they went back in the data record of the, the patients and did an analysis on those records. So an observation study that compared adults with COVID-19 receiving chloroquine phosphate. Again, look at the, the drug, chloroquine phosphate, 500 milligram once or twice daily with patients not receiving chloroquine found minor fever resolution with biological clearance benefits. So this is actually a meta-analysis, which they cite here as well in 31. In 32, they are citing the study that I just looked at. Now let's look at this third study. 
that they are citing in 33 point here. And that is this. So there is a, a comment from James Kelly, problem with the long biological half-life of chloroquine could exaggerate and worsen side effects. Absolutely. The half-life of these drugs can be up to 22 days. So if, if it is given to someone and they start developing issues, it is possible that those issues stay for a longer period of time. This is why when I ask my patients to use hydroxychloroquine, what I do is I ask them to take 200 milligram hydroxychloroquine, take their heart rate before and blood pressure before taking this, and then during that day, look at their, uh, their blood pressure and heart rate. If it works fine, if there is not much change, then they take the second dose in the evening and then they monitor their heart rate once again. And if it stays fine, then I start adding zinc, uh, azithromax and zinc. So I kind of look at the, the effect of the hydroxychloroquine on a patient before I continue to add dose and continue to give them over multiple period of time. So James, you are correct. At the same time, it can be given in, in a way that one can look at the patient state, one can look at the effect of the drug and then give, and then it should be given in therapeutic doses. The safe therapeutic dose for hydroxychloroquine has been five milligram per kilogram body weight. So normally about 200 to 400 milligram per day, 400 milligram per day is safe. Again, not it's not in a prescription, so don't take it. It is a safe therapeutic dose that has been assessed. Now, look at this study here. Clinical efficacy of hydroxychloroquine in patients with COVID-19 pneumonia who require oxygen, who require oxygen, observational comparative study. So once again, there are two things in this study. One, they are the patients who already are in requirement of oxygen. Their saturation was below 90%. So I think that at that time, chloroquine start becoming less effective, hydroxychloroquine. And then secondly, it is an observational study. Once again, it is an observation of the previously occurred data. It is not a prospective study. So if you see here, design comparative observational study using data collected from routine care. Participants, 181 patients aged 18 to 80 years with documented severe acute respiratory syndrome, pneumonia who required oxygen but not intensive care. Interventions. Hydroxychloroquine, check the, check the dose. At dose of 600 milligram per day within 48 hours of admission to hospital treatment group versus standard care without hydroxychloroquine. So what they're doing is one dose of 600 milligram. Fine, it's not that bad. It is slightly above the therapeutic dose, but that's fine. It's better than 2600 or, or 2800 that has been given by some other trials. So 600 milligram per day, but only once. And they are, I think they're banking on the, um, on the half-life of it, that these drugs have a half-life, which is 22 days. So maybe it is fine to just give one dose and, and then feel that it is. So the thing is, in all of these studies, I'm seeing flaws or anomalies that make the study less valuable in my point of view. Again, they may be right. Maybe there will be data that comes out and says hydroxychloroquine doesn't do anything. But till that time, at least the studies have to have some merit in them. And look at the results. In the main analysis, 84 patients who received hydroxychloroquine within 48 hours of admission to hospital were compared with 89 patients who did not receive hydroxychloroquine control group. Eight additional patients received hydroxychloroquine more than 48 hours after the admission. So the result was, they said, and check this out, they are saying, that in the transfer to intensive care unit at day 21 was 76% in the treatment group and 75% in the control group. So basically the treatment group did slightly worse. And then they're saying here, overall survival at day 21 was 89% in the treatment group and 91% in the control group. So they're saying that actually hydroxychloroquine treatment group was doing worst. Survival without acute respiratory distress syndrome at day 21 was 69% in the treatment group and 74% in the con control group. So once again, control group did better. And similarly, um, 
at day 21, 82% of patients in the treatment group had been weaned from oxygen compared with 76% in the control group. So here there is slight improvement on the, on the treatment group. But once again, important thing is it's one dose of hydroxychloroquine. It is given within 20, 48 hours of admission to hospital. And that is when they start measuring them. So once again, if somebody is admitted to hospital, they probably, I do not have the data to, or I did not look at the data to see exactly what was the profile of the people. But um, again, the dose and only giving it once, giving it without zinc and without Azithromax, it seems a little less interesting study to me. But anyways, that's what they have cited here. Then the next study they cite is association of treatment with hydroxychloroquine or azithromycin with in-hospital mortality in patients with COVID-19 in New York State. So if I go back here to this study, this is that one. And here what they're doing is they're saying it's a retrospective study. So once again, it is not a prospective study. It is not a controlled, randomized, blind, double-blind study. What they're saying is retrospective multicenter cohort study of patients from a random sample for all admitted patients with laboratory confirmed COVID-19 in 25 hospitals representing 88.2% of patients with COVID-19 in the New York metropolitan region. So that's a very large number. They're saying that in the New York metropolitan region, we looked at 88.2% of all the patients. And then here is the data. What are they saying here? Look at this. So among 1,438 hospitalized patients with a diagnosis of COVID-19, those receiving hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, or both were likely than those not receiving. If you notice here, zinc is missing. Second thing is they are hospitalized. Now, either drug, so then, so what they saw was both were more likely, so the patient were more likely than those not receiving either drug to have diabetes. So the effects were diabetes, respiratory rate, greater than 22 minutes, uh, per, uh, 22 per minute, abnormal chest imaging finding, oxygen saturation below 90%, and EST amino transfer is greater than 40. So again, I do not see that there is a, one, there is zinc that is missing. Secondly, this, the saturation is below 90. Now look at the overall, the results here, the probability, the probability of death for patients receiving hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin was 25.7%. Compare that to hydroxychloroquine alone, 19%. So they're saying AZ plus hydroxychloroquine, the probability of death in this group was more, 25.7%, compared to those who were on hydroxychloroquine alone, 19.9%, then compared to azithromycin alone, which was 10%, and neither drug, 12%. So once again, no zinc here. Secondly, I once again, for this study, it's a retrospective study that itself is a limitation of the analysis here. And then the patients are, I believe if I'm reading it correctly, they are already below 90% saturation. So cool that we have a study, but again, will I make a decision based on this study? I will not. Then the next study here, a randomized trial of hydroxychloroquine as post-exposure prophylaxis for COVID-19. This is interesting. What they're saying is here, they are looking at patients, people who are confirmed COVID-19 exposed, and then they're starting them on hydroxychloroquine, and then they are seeing if they are going to develop the disease or not. So let's look at this. We conducted a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial across the United States and parts of Canada. So this study structure looks good. It's randomized. It is double-blind. That means doctor doesn't know what, which medicine is being given. Patient doesn't know which medicine is being given. Are they given placebo or not? Both the parties do not know it. Placebo-controlled. So there is placebo versus the drug. And then there is a nice swath here. Testing hydroxychloroquine as post-exposure prophylaxis. We enrolled adults who had household or occupational exposure to someone with confirmed COVID-19 at a distance of less than six feet for more than 10 minutes while wearing neither a face mask nor an eye shield. 
or while wearing a face mask but no eye shield, moderate risk. Within four days after exposure, we randomly assigned participants to receive either placebo or hydroxychloroquine. Look at the dose, 800 milligram once, followed by 600 milligram in six to eight hours, then 600 milligram daily for four additional. So look, the first day, what have they done? 800 milligram by then 600 milligram in six to eight hours. So let's say eight hours. So I get 800 milligram in the morning, then within eight hours, that is the same day, I get another 600 milligram. So that makes 800 plus 600 is 1400 milligram of the dose on the first day. Then 600 milligram daily for four additional days, but there is no zinc, no zithromax. And I can understand no zithromax because it's not needed. But the original French study that was small, but and they came up with it, they had said that they used these three things together, hydroxychloroquine, azithromax, and zinc. So zinc is not here. The primary outcome was the incidence of either laboratory confirmed COVID-19 or illness compatible with COVID-19 within 14 days. So then they looked at these people and saw that would they get COVID-19 within 14 days. So here is what's happening, results. 821 asymptomatic participants. Overall, it is 7.6% of the participants reported a high risk exposure. The incidence of new illness compatible with COVID-19 did not differ significantly between participants receiving hydroxychloroquine, 11.8%, and those receiving placebo, 14.3%. So hydroxychloroquine people were a little less uh, moving towards the disease compared to the placebo. The absolute difference was minus 2.4%. So side effects were more common with hydroxychloroquine than with the placebo, 16.8%, 40% versus 16.8%, but no serious adverse reactions were reported. So this is the study itself is decent. I like it. But what is missing in here is the proper regime of using zinc with it. Then, and the authors of uh, uh, Math Plus here, they admit that, and then here the 36th point or the study citing, improving the efficacy of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. This is not a study, this is really a letter. And here, improving the efficacy of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine against SARS-CoV-2 may require zinc additives, a better synergy for future. So here, this is a letter where they're saying, more recent studies have highlighted the possibility of treating patients infected with the no novel corona uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus with chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, of which mechanism of action is not completely understood. We seek to draw the attention of the scientific community to possibility of drastically reducing the effect of the virus on the affected patients and improving clinical trials out outcome through the synergistic action of zinc and chloroquine in patients suffering from the coronavirus. So <clears throat> what they're saying here is that, hey, we are asking the people who are doing studies to use zinc as well. So this is in all of those studies. The only study I really can say is a slightly better structured is this one where they try to give it at the prophylaxis they did not have zinc with it but the remaining structure looks fine the first day dose was very high um, but fine uh, let's say that we ignore the complications other than that they had been giving hydroxychloroquine for four five days without zinc and this was a properly structured study and they did not find significant difference. So this is what I wanted to discuss today, that um, Math Plus protocol has done this change. I want to go over the protocol. They have updated it since uh, yesterday or since 17. That was yesterday. So if you are OK and I can spend another five minutes with you, I want to just go over the protocol once more and kind of refresh your mind for how it is. I still like the protocol. I just don't feel that the thing that they have cited the studies they don't make too much sense to me so are you comfortable going over the protocol once more just a few of the items here so some reminders for us are the following number one they are saying that systemic use of the math plus protocol in two hospitals in the USA has, I don't know who wrote this sentence, the systemic use of the Math Plus protocol in two hospital in the USA has reduced the hospital mortality 
from COVID-19 to approximately 3.5%. The question that I have is that if it is the mortality reduction to 3.5%, do they have any other hospital to give an example to say, well, they were 6% or 7%. So that is what I am not sure, but I'm sure that this is a good thing that it is reduced. That's one. The second thing is they keep stressing this, and I stand behind this statement of them, that this is a, in, in the beginning, the disease is virus impacting, uh, virus cause, uh, caused by the virus itself. But then as the patient progresses further in the disease and their immune system is unable to handle the situation and becomes overwhelmingly active, then it becomes an inflammatory uh, issue or a cytokine storm or a macrophage activation syndrome issue more than the virus itself. So the treatment first is to try to handle the virus. Treatment in the second part is not to handle the virus. Virus is actually gone. I know patients here on the, on the ventilator whose RT-PCR is negative, but they are not able to come off of the ventilator. And that is because the disease has now become an inflammatory runaway system. And so Math Plus says that, hey, this is a uh, management of that inflammatory system, not just the virus. And they have a very important message here that we saw that last time too, and I want to Re refresh that in our minds here and that is that this is a let's see where that point is this is a steroid responsive disease because at this stage if you see here instead of the virus causing the damage here, immune system is causing the damage so with this let's look at the study just to refresh our mind prophylaxis Vitamin C and quercetin and zinc. So good, like that. And somebody had asked me this question last time that what do these brackets and numbers mean? So these brackets and numbers are citing the studies in the appendix. So if you go down to the appendix, they have various studies that back up their statement here or the usage of the drug. So study number one to seven or reference number one to seven. Then zinc 75 to 100 milligram per day, that is fine. Mel melatonin, we talked about it. We've talked about all of those. I just wanted to refresh it once more in our mind. Vitamin D3, 1,000 to 4,000 units. I usually give 5,000 units daily, but anyways, 1,000 to 4,000 they have. And famotidine, 20 to 40 milligram per day. This is the prophylaxis. Of course, they have not, uh, they're not looking at hydroxy or zinc or those things together over here. Symptomatic patient at home, vitamin C, quercetin, zinc. I would put them all together. Uh, I think that they, melatonin is here, vitamin D3 is here. The thing that they do not have, and that is what is, is the math plus plus protocol from our point of view, we, the cool beans, have been looking at those things. And that is that N acetyl cysteine should be here, CoQ10 should be here, and then uh, certain more supplements that we talked about, like glutathione those need to be here as well. Uh, vitamin C, zinc, melatonin, vitamin D3. Then look at this. At home, they recommend optionally aspirin, famotidine, and ivermectin. So they are more in favor, again, optionally to ivermectin. I will actually put ivermectin with doxycycline here. And remember, I'll keep saying it. Ivermectin is uh, dangerous. It can cause permanent brain damage for those people who have um, blood brain barrier, which is not mature. And that may be somebody who has meningitis and the blood brain barrier is mature, but damaged at that time or inflamed or fetus has an immature blood brain barrier or a baby that is uh, still nursing from their mother has an yet developing blood brain barrier. So pregnant women cannot take ivermectin, lactating women cannot take ivermectin and then people who are meningitis, who has mani have meningitis, they cannot take ivermectin. So with the contraindications and the drug interactions looked at, I would make ivermectin as a not optional, as a mandatory regime over here. And that is the same thing that I would have with the uh, hydroxychloroquine as well. If hydroxychloroquine can suit a person, then hydroxychloroquine has been very, very valuable. Uh, in symptomatic patients, monitoring with home with pulse oximeter is recommended. I believe pulse oximeter is a critical thing to save a life. 
Why? Because what I've been doing with the, my patients, I see patients internationally. What I've been doing is that anytime their oxygen saturation goes below 95, 94, one, I make them alert that if it is below 93, go to a hospital. Secondly, do prone positioning. And they do prone positioning and it helps really well. Uh, prone positioning with the proper understanding of the oxygen and, and adjustment of the drugs has really been great. So far, I can report that all the cases, most of the cases I've seen are families that the whole family is affected. Uh, 16 or 17 families so far in the last one month. And I've used this regime and uh, I am blessed. I touch wood here. None of them has ever ended up in hospital, including three cases where I was very afraid that not only they would end up in hospital, but they would end up um, on, on a ventilator given their comorbidities, but they were safe as well. So thank God. And I'm happy with that. So here, pulse oximeter is recommended. Ambulatory desaturation lesser than 94 should prompt hospital admission. Not recommended. We just talked about this. Then this is the inpatient or in the hospital management. Vitamin C, 500, quercetin, 250, and then zinc, melatonin, vitamin D3, enoxaprine, sorry, my, um, somehow the, <laughs> the underlining became a little upset here, uh, melatonin, then symptomatic patients consider increasing the dose to one milligram. I have to make sure that I can, okay, now it is good. Enoxaprine, which is anticoagulant, methylprednisolone. So look, they have started on the methyl methylprednisolone, right, mildly symptomatic in the hospital. And I think that is the right time. And they say it, they say that the methyl, the steroids have to start it within a six hours window of when you feel as a doctor that this patient is going to become aggravated. And at that time, with, you have a six hours window to just start uh, uh, the anticoagulation plus the steroids and just prevent the patient to progressing further. So met methylprednisolone 40 milligram every 12, 12 hour and then 80 milligram in patients progressive symptoms. And they have increasing CRP. The CRP is their metric to see if the CRP continues to, that is a C-reactive protein. And I believe all the cool beans know over here that the C-reactive protein is increased when there is acute uh, inflammation and interleukin-1 and interleukin-6 go and hammer the liver. Liver then produces the acute phase proteins. One of those is C-reactive protein that can be measured. Then famotidine, we saw the study in the past that famotidine somehow reduces the mortality in COVID-19 patients. They do not know the mechanism, but it does. And compared to other um, uh, drugs of the similar class, this is the only one that does this. So they don't know how does it do it. Optional remdesivir. Um, I think that remdesivir has been at least 30, 40% efficacy is shown. So even if one life is saved, it is useful. Ivermectin is optional. I do not know if the Ivermectin becomes a heavyweight drug at this stage, but they are saying that give one dose of Ivermectin. I use more than one dose. Uh, avoid nebulization and respiratory treatment. Use spinhaler. Then avoid CPAP or BiPAP transfer early to the ICU. So this is the inpatient. Now here, if the patient has shortness of breath, hypoxia requiring NC greater than four liter per minute, which we have discussed in the past as well, it is similar, methylprednisolone 80 milligram. So this is where if you combine the math plus protocol with the dexamethasone study, then of course the authors of this protocol insist that methylprednisolone is better when managing the uh, with the cardiac system and it has better penetration for the cardiac, uh, sorry, heart tissue. Uh, I'm talking about respiratory tissue. I think that at this stage, because the inflammation is like the uh, spread in the whole body, it is possible to actually go to dexamethasone to have a overall bigger picture of the body taken control uh, care of as well. And I like dexamethasone is like five, five times more potent than this. But anyways, they still... They are aware of the dexamethasone study, but they still prefer methylprednisolone. Then ascorbic acid, 
full anticoagulation with enoxaparin or with heparin or with tissue plasminogen um, uh, agonist and so on. Then there is this interesting new uh, comment here and that is due to augmented renal clearance, patients may have reduced NT factor 10 activity despite standard dosage of low molecular weight heparin. In, if this is the case, we therefore recommend monitoring NTXA activity in underweight and obese patients. So again, the people who are going to manage patients in ICU, I think they can understand what they're saying here. They are looking at the D-dimers as well and NTX activity. Then they're saying if falling uh, oxygen saturation, despite respiratory symptoms, should be triggered to start anti-inflammatory treatment, which we just saw, early termination of ascorbic acid and corticosteroid will likely result in rebound effect or clinical deterioration. Then here is their full Monty, everything that they have offered, melatonin, famatidine, vitamin D, thiamine, magnesium, azithromycin, simvastatin. We haven't talked about statins so far. Remdesivir, broad spectrum antibiotics if needed, and keep the volume euvolemic, meaning do not over uh, hydrate them. That would cause increase in ARDS situation. Norepinephrine for septic shock, so that would keep the blood vessels constricted and blood pressure is maintained with that. That is a standard treatment in uh, septic shocks. We haven't talked about norepinephrine either. Then here, escalation of respiratory support, except permissive hypoxia. So they're saying it's okay if there is hypoxia, don't rush towards a ventilator. So keep oxygen saturation greater than 84%. And then uh, nasal cannula, 16, 1 to 6 liter per minute, high flow nasal cannula of 60 to 80 liter per minute, trial of Flolan. So that is epoprosinol. We talked about that as well with the uh, that is a platelet activation inhibitor, remember. Uh, attempt proning, so that is important. I actually believe proning should be done in the early stages as well. R great results I've seen with proning. Um, intubation, if needed, and then volume protective ventilation, and then uh, moderate sedation for preventing the self-extubation. Similar thing as last time, uh, not much change here. The salvage treatment, when the patient is now getting into a stress now, then you're trying to salvage the situation. So corticosteroids are increased from 120 to 250 milligram. I still believe dexamethasone is a better choice. Plasma exchange, we've talked about it. Then tocilizumab or siltuximab, the, these are IL-6 inhibitors. We talked about them as well. Convalescent plasma, then CV, CVVH with cytokine absorbing filters. So that is the machine. Then this is a new one they have added, Janus kinase inhibitors. And we can talk about the Janus kinase inhibitors if you like. ECMO if needed. W was there? No, no. So there is a comment there. Doctor, I think that is meant to be 94% saturation. Here, what they're saying is, if I go back here, this is a permissive hypoxemia. So they are saying that do not rush to ventilator if a patient is in ICU. So let's say a patient is at home and the oxygen saturation falls below 94, they should go to hospital. In the hospital, now they are on oxygenation. If the oxygenation oxygen saturation still continues to drop, they are saying till 84, hold your horses to go to a ventilator. Don't do it. Keep allowing yourself not to panic as a doctor and just live with it that they are going to go down to 84. Till that time, do anticoagulation and steroids. And then if it falls below 84 in the hospital, then the ICU and the, um, what is that? The ventilator is coming in. So here, this is not supposed to be, I mean, you can say that 94 or nine, greater than 94 is the ideal, but what they are saying is permissive hypoxemia is okay. So if you're not able to control this very well or bring it up, then if it is staying near 84, it is fine. Just keep giving them the drugs and don't put them on ventilator yet. Keep giving them oxygen. And remember that this is a case that in, in some people, it just keeps making them worst. So they're saying till 84, don't put them on ventilator. That is their primary objective here, that treat with steroids and don't put them on ventilator that soon. But once they are, they've touched 84, that is when there is cutoff point and ventilator is needed. 
So salvage treatment, back to this one. High-dose high corticosteroids, plasma exchange, siltuximab and tocilizumab, convalescent serum, CVBH, Janus kinase, and ECMO. This is the treatment of the macrophage activation syndrome, or you can say kind of a cytokine storm. So here, ferritin level is considered. Ferritin level of greater than 4,400 nanogram per milliliter is considered macrophage activation syndrome. High-dose corticosteroids, methylprednisolone, 120 milligram every six to eight hours. So again, for the doctors, they have a choice now with dexamethasone as well. And then consider plasma exchange, then an akindra, which is interleukin-1 inhibitor. We talked about that as well in the past, not as a separate drug, but in the math plus protocol. Then they have various things that need to be monitored. The most important things are CRP, ferritin, D-dimer, and PCT. Of course, patient's QT interval has to be looked at as well. And post-ICU, patient is kept on enoxaparin, methylprednisolone, vitamin C, and melatonin. This is the discussion. Let me just quickly go over it to see anything else here. The core principle of the pulmonary phase is the use of anti-inflammatory agents to dampen the cytokine storm. Together with full anticoagulation to limit the microvascular and macrovascular clotting and supplemental oxygen to help overcome the hypoxia. That is a core principle of this um, whole thing. Patients in whom the cytokine storm is not dampened will progress into the H phenotype. We've talked about the L and H phenotypes, so that's not, we, we know that part already. The combination of steroids and ascorbic acid is essential. So, is made an interesting cause. Zinc is essential for innate and adaptive immunity. In addition, zinc inhibits RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. That is a discussion we have been doing. Quercetin has direct varicidal properties against a range of viruses, including SARS-CoV-2. In addition, quercetin acts as a zinc ionophore. And then vitamin C improves the potency of quercetin and its antiviral effect. Then look at this comment. I love this one. Vitamin D may be a very powerful prophylactic and treatment strategy against COVID-19. So this is where we are for today. I wanted to make sure that we look at those uh, uh, studies that they are referring while they are removing. They are actually saying not recommending. So wanted us to kind of look at that. I hope this is good. Tomorrow, um, would you like to do iodine or would you like to talk about some of the drugs that are left here or any other topic if you, you would like, we can talk about that as well. For example, statins or norepinephrine or iodine. So please let me know what would you like to talk about. I would request you to look at the Math Plus protocol as well. And finally, for my own self, I would request you to like, subscribe and share. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow. Thank you for your time. Please, meanwhile, stay safe, stay happy, stay blessed, and stay healthy. I'll talk to you tomorrow.